Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Lauren Groff is the author of Matrix. She is a two-time National Book Award finalist and the New York Times bestselling author of three novels, The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, and Fates and Furies, plus their celebrated short story collections, Delicate Edible Birds, and Florida. She has won the Story Prize, the Penn O. Henry Award, and has been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her work regularly appears in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and elsewhere, and she was named one of Granta's 2017 Best Young American Novelist. She lives in Gainesville, Florida, with her husband and sons. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss your new books, Matrix. Very exciting. Thank you for having (laughs) me. I appreciate it. So for listeners who aren't familiar with your work, and particularly this one, would you mind giving a little synopsis for this book? And then we can talk about your whole career and everything else. Sure. So I've been obsessed with this medieval poet named Marie de France since college, which was many years ago at this point. And I had wanted to write a book about her because nobody knows much about who she was. Because women in the 12th century were not considered important unless they gave birth to kings or they were married to kings or they were the daughters of wealthy men. So nobody knows who Marie de France was, but she wrote these incredible poems called Lay. I fell in love with them. And I got very, very excited a couple of years ago about writing about this time period because I thought it would be a really interesting way to sort of see the contemporary world a bit slant. I felt overwhelmed by all of the the problems of the contemporary world. I almost felt as if it was a moral issue that I couldn't actually write about them as deeply as I wanted to. But I could if I were situating a lot of the, the issues at their roots in the 12th century. So this is a book about my imagined life of Marie de France as an abbess in England in the 12th and early 13th centuries. And it is a wild book. It's probably my strangest book so far. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. I, you know, I hope it, I hope others will. <laughs> I love that. It's so funny to identify your own work as, as wild. Which parts, like what, when you're thinking about it, like what makes you say that? Well, Marie is a mystic. And so a lot of her mysticism is drawn actually from the actual mystics of the time. I I went back and I looked at Hildegard of Bingen and I looked at Julian of Norwich and I looked at a bunch of other incredible mystics and female mystics. One of the most astonishing things about them was that they were able to create power and space for themselves to maneuver by their mysticism in this time when there were just incredibly rigid hierarchical structures caging women in. And so these mystics, through their visions of God and Virgin Mary, were able to sort of craft a safe haven for themselves. So so that part of it is really wild. The structure of it is based on a eunuch crystal medieval labyrinth. So that the structure itself is also wild. We get to see the entire life of this woman who is in many ways a misfit for her time, but who is also very powerful in both sides of of the word power, right? She's powerful because she's very capable and very smart, but she's also, she has internalized some of the ideas about power that she then, I guess, spreads to her nuns under her care also. So she's a complicated figure. I think she's wild in that sense too. So this is like a massive undertaking. This, I mean, all the ways, all the things you did with this book. Um, when you thought of it, were you like, totally, I'm totally going to do this? Or were you at all intimidated by your ideas when they came? To, like, what was that moment like for you? Yeah. So, okay. I'm not going to pretend that I'm a mystic either, but I do. I had been thinking about this for a long, long time. And then I went to this lecture by my friend, Dr. Katie Bugis, who teaches now at Notre Dame. and 
as I was sitting in the audience, she was she was talking about the liturgical practices of 12th century nuns. I just sort of saw the book in front of me. It was it wasn't complete, right? I hadn't didn't have all the details, but I could see the way that I could sort of filter my understanding of the contemporary world through this figure. And it just sort of came to me. And it's not that it was easier than any, I don't think it's easy to write any novel at all, especially not my, my book, because I really don't know what I'm doing until the four or five drafts in, and we can talk about that later. But, you know, I, I did have this very, very strong sense of the kind of book I wanted to write, and it was immediate. And I just knew that sitting down every single day, I was just slowly bringing myself to that point. Yeah. So I wasn't cowed in a way that I have been in the past with other books, but I was, I, I did know how I basically had to get a master's in medieval history <laughs> while I was doing this. <laughs> Wait, I want to talk about what you just said about the multiple drafts, but I want to also go back and figure out, well, first of all, how do you have such a beautiful French accent? Are you part French? Did you grow up? Did you, what is that about? Or- oh, that's very sweet. No, I spent a year as a Rotary Youth Fellow in between high school and college in Nantes, France, where I lived with a catering family. They they had the the fourth largest catering business in France. And I learned to speak French through them and through eating a huge amount of food and drinking so much alcohol. <laughs> like beautiful. <laughs> the Quai Royale every single night. It was really spectacular. So I think once your your feelings of shyness have been worn off by a couple of KYL, you can you can start to speak with some ease. Wow. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I spent a summer, I guess it wasn't enough, when I was 14 or 15, I think I was 14, in France. And I lived with a family. They owned a pool company a pool, like a oh, pool. wow, yeah. So we were in the south of France, and it was one of the only houses with a pool, and it was amazing because the guy owned the pool. Anyway, it was very exciting, <laughs> and I did cool. like start dreaming in French after that. By the end of that summer, like I was like totally immersed. And now yes. that I'm, you know, thirty years later or whatever, I, you know, I can't even pretend to speak with an accent like that because I'm such an imposter. I can basically understand no! everything, but I can't speak anymore. I can't remember the words. I can't like find them, but I can understand them. Anyway. I bet it would take you maybe a week before everything just sort of flowed back. Oh, the yeah. language is this amazing thing. Yeah, language is so deeply embedded in who we are. And it's so beautiful to see it reawakening. So one of my sons had an au pair for a year from Spain, and she only spoke to him in Spanish. He was about, he was between one and two at this point. And I think he, he thought that he forgot everything for years, nine years. And then we had spent maybe two days in Mexico City and he started responding in Spanish. So there no was way. this deeply ingrained, very unusual, uh, like pathways that he just hadn't used in a very long time. They just started coming back. So I think it'll come back. I don't know. I feel like those pathways are so buried under the, like, <laughs> like you know, they're like the subway system of Manhattan. There's like giant buildings built on top of those, <laughs> of those pathways at this point. It would be, take a lot of excavation to retrieve them, but maybe, maybe we'll see. <laughs> so, and let's go back also, like, how did you become a writer? Did you always know you wanted to do this? Like, what was your education? Where are you even from? Like, what's what's your story? How do we get here? So I'm from Cooperstown, New York. It's a tiny little town in upstate New York. Most people know it because baseball. of the Hall of Fame. Well, yeah, baseball, baseball, is baseball Hall of Fame. The Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah. There's also a beautiful lake. James Benamark Cooper is from there. There's an opera called Glimmer Glass. It's like a very idyllic, beautiful place to grow up. And my parents are extraordinarily hardworking people who basically left my siblings and I just up to our own business. So we spent all of our time doing sports and reading books, basically. Swimming in the lake. It was a really beautiful childhood for for a writer. I wanted to be a writer from the time I was 12 when someone gave me uh, Emily Dickinson's collected poems. And I thought I was a poet because she makes it seem so easy, which is hilarious. If if you've ever written a poem, you know how hard it is to write like Emily Dickinson. But as a 12 year old, I thought, oh my God, I can do this. And so secretly I was writing secret poetry through France. And then I got to college. I tried to take a couple of poetry classes. They wouldn't let me in because my poetry is bad. And I finally got into a fiction class. And up to that point, I, I was a dual major in both French literature and English literature. But I hadn't actually really studied any contemporary work 
by anyone at all. I mean, I hadn't read any books from you know, after 1950. And suddenly in this course packet, I get short stories by people like Grace Paley, Joy Williams, Lori Moore. And my brain just sort of like shorted out. I mean, it was like, I was reading these people, I was hearing these voices that were so similar to my own. And I think for the first time in my life, I was always an enormous reader, but for the first time in my life, I thought, oh my gosh, wait, I don't have to be a secret poet. Maybe I could actually write fiction and be a living contemporary author of fiction. And after that, I, you know, I spent three years trying to write at night while as a bartender, and then I worked as an admin assistant at Stanford University, and finally got my MFA. And from then on, I've been a full-time writer. So yeah, it was it was it was a process, but I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to my parents first of all for just for their benign neglect, for sure. So when you're working on your different books, like how long does it take you to write one of these masterpieces? Oh, very sweet. Well, it just depends on the book. So some books take five or six years. Uh, Some books actually, Matrix only took me a full year of writing eight to 12 hours a day. Wow. So yeah. So this one I I worked on very intensely in a short period of time. A lot of them, so I work on multiple projects at once too, because I do believe that fiction requires a great deal of silence and darkness and time. They're like mushrooms. They have to grow in the dark. And often if you're working on only one thing, you're just putting way too much pressure on that single thing. So when I work on multiple things at once, which is always, they sort of cross fertilize in the darkness and in my subconscious. And the the ones that don't have as much energy or juice, I can feel good about walking away from for the moment and, and focusing on the ones that are sort of shouting at me and feeling very excited and and ready. So it's it's this, it's a beautiful slow process for most of my work, to be honest. I mean, a lot of times I'll start something, put it aside after a draft because I know it's just not working in the way that I chose to tell it. And then a few years later, don't pick up what I'd done, but pick up the idea and try again and for a different draft. I do a lot, a lot of drafts. And this is what you meant Uh, before when you said it was like four or five drafts for each book. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, but Fates and Fury, so one of my last novel before Matrix, I was 13 full, totally rewritten drafts from the beginning. And I, I write them from the beginning in longhand primarily because I cannot actually read my own handwriting. It's so egregious that, and I don't want to until all of the the foundational issues have been figured out, right? I don't, I don't want to pretend as though my book is anything less than the immensely flawed and failed thing that it has to be for the first however many drafts until I understand sort of the the iceberg underneath the surface and the the structure that I'm going for and the tone and the sort of the language that I'm trying to use. All of these things have to be figured out first before I even attempt to try to write something that will remain. Wow. I feel like you are like, I'm like, it's not surprising that you root like that Matrix is from you know, what almost a thousand years ago. It's like you seem like not other otherworldly sounds. Like you're like such a like a a literary you know I I, I can't even think of the right word like wordsmith. Like I don't know. You just seem so gifted and talented in a in a different way than most people today. Like that you're like not of this era or something in the way that you're talking <laughs> about literature and craft and you know there's this like magic. I don't know. It's very cool. I hope you recognize it in yourself that this is not like the typical contemporary author, which perhaps is why you're getting nominated for all these awards and all this other stuff. But it's really no. interesting to listen to you. It's great. <laughs> to be honest, I'm a really, really anxious person and I get in my own way all the time if I don't find ways to get around myself and to, to put my ego so far away in the ocean that I can't even see it. And part of it is coming back to this idea that the work of the heart is work that we do simulating the play that we did as children, right? And when you, if you, if you watch your children play, playing with Legos, playing with friends out on the street, playing, there's just this, this feeling of surrendering to the joy of the moments that we lose, I think, if we put too much pressure on ourselves. So, And I'm a person, 
I have OCD issues. I have anxiety issues. I have like I have the whole gamut of issues. But the way that I've gone about figuring out how to get beyond these issues is really just to remember that I'm just I'm having I'm just trying to create joy, right? This is what we're doing. So sometimes that means dealing with the immense frustration of having to write a full draft of something that you think maybe maybe it's it. And then being like, well, no, it's not (laughs) starting over again. Right. And that is really frustrating, but it's also really cathartic and coming back to the beginning with a sense of just pure pleasure. Right. This is what we're what we're doing is not brain surgery. Right. What we're doing is just joyous. And and it should be the way that we felt when we were making mud patties when we were a kid. You know, it, it should be beautiful. And so resetting expectations, not for I think the end result, but for the process and for trying to to dig deeper into the sentences and find the the beautiful spark at the the heart of every single good sentence. That's where you have, I have to, just to be a sane human on this planet with all of my many mental issues, to be able to be sane and do this work. Yeah, it's not not caring about, it is caring eventually, but it's not caring at the moment about the external issues, right? And I think that this goes back to most of the things that we do. And I can't maintain this for anything but my work. (laughs) I am the worst cook on the planet because I'm very impatient and people are just going to eat it anyway. And like, I mean, I might as well just make a, a lasagna and eat it for four days. <laughs> then, right? like make, that sounds like great of, cooking right. to me. That's way more than oh. I do. So, you know, <laughs> just making a lasagna, are you kidding? That's like, I haven't made the lasagna, I don't think, in my life. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, so we're vegetarian. And so it's really hard, actually, to, especially in Florida, where we are to find good food external to the house. So like, I we have to cook. But yeah, so but like, but okay, so just to get back to the point, which is it's just play. We're just playing and and trying to remember that we're playing is sort of the basis of my practice. Wow. Yeah. Well, I love that self-awareness. I mean, this is like, you know, whatever mental issues you may have, it sounds like you're working with somebody <laughs> amazing because you are harnessing it all. <laughs> I need to get that phone number, please. You know, I feel like, you know, I don't know what percent, I have to like go back and do a survey of all the people I've interviewed because I feel like, I don't know, 80 to 90% of all authors have anxiety. Like that's why, yes, right? Yes, if everyone. not, if uh-huh. not a hundred. <laughs> and so I don't know, that's why this podcast yeah. in part like makes me feel so like I found my people, right? Cause everyone has some of the stuff that I have that like, maybe I didn't talk like, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's very <laughs> comforting in a way. Same. Yes. And this is one of those beautiful things. The more you talk to writers, the more you're like, oh, we're all messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is great. Yeah. So it's a weird thing that like I live half my life in somebody else's life by reading about it. Really? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like reading itself is like the craziest thing. Really, I mean, you know, I'm putting my brain, yeah. anyway, whatever. So it's true. You're, you're allowing your brain to be colonized by another brain. Yes. You know, you really are yeah. you're letting someone else's ghost speak into your ear for the, the time it takes to read a book. That's a, an incredible dissolution of the borders of self, right? I mean, it's really, we're, we're dissolving the self into another person. That's beautiful. It's, it's, it's wild. It's science fiction. Reading's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that's my favorite description of reading ever. Yes. It's like science fiction. I always say it's like magic, but it's not. You're right. Science fiction is a much better way to describe it. Excellent. You must be a writer. This is great. Great, great language. So I'm sure you have 57 projects going on. Do you have any idea what's coming out after this book? I do actually. So I was working on a different book when I started Matrix and that one, I think I'm finishing and that will be the next one. And it deals with some very similar issues. It's, you know, women in within the confines of the religion that they were sort of forced to, to be in coming up against the boundaries of nature. So that's what happens with Marie as the abbess in Matrix. It's what happens to my character set in 1609 in Jamestown in the next book. So I think, I think, I hope, knock on wood, it might be out in 2023, but who knows, right? Who knows if there will still be published by then? <laughs> there will. There will. <laughs> I, 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 think I'm, I think I'm booked until then. So they're <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Well, you've already given so many pieces of advice along the way. But as a final question for advice for aspiring authors, because I ask everybody this each time, 
what advice would you have? So the only advice I would ever give to any author is something that I tell myself every single day. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is find the way to play, right? Find the way to to take yourself less seriously and let the work itself just, just feel joy. And sometimes that means taking a step back and doing things that seem only slantwise involved in the work. So some days I cannot actually write. I cannot actually put a word down, but I show up. And and those days, maybe I'll take out my large container of paint chips or paint, you know, swabs from the, the uh, Home Depot and go through them and find the color toward which I will write a scene, right? And so, so maybe that the tone of the color will somehow seep back into the scene and show me something new. Or I'll do an exercise, an Ulipo exercise, or Right. Or I'll go for a run. And sometimes in just being an animal in our animal bodies, that's where the work actually comes in. So remember that play is just as essential to to the work that we're doing as the work itself of being faithful, sitting down as often as we possibly can daily, if possible, and taking ourselves and our work seriously. But it's also, it's joyous, right? And it's this give and take between seriousness and joy that that we have to try to, to always hit. Have you written this in an essay or something? Uh, well, sort of. I mean, I, Michigan Quarterly Review, I give a lecture for the Zell writers that I think it just came out. And, and I do go into it for a good preachy span. <laughs> but it is, it's the way that I try to, try to approach all work. And I do think that if we remember that what we're doing is an absolute privilege, then maybe if everything else feels really hard, maybe gratitude will get us to the desk. That's also good. Wow. Well, if you, in your spare time, want to write an essay for moms that don't have time to write about either the science fiction of reading or writing as play, we would love it. So I would love to read it. I would love to refer back to it. I would love to keep it as, I would like to print it and put a little picture frame on my desk. So (laughs) that would be awesome if you, if you feel like it, but I'm sure. I would love to. Oh my gosh. I like, I actually had a small panic attack this morning about the things that are happening that I have to finish, but yes, I will keep it on the burner and maybe someday I'll do it. <laughs> the, person, um, the author I interviewed right before you today, her name is Bethany Crandall and her book was about like middle-aged women kind of snapping, right? Like just, uh, and we were trading, you know, what we did to like sort of manage the chaos. So I was literally oh, yeah. saying like, breathing for me is not like meditative breathing. It's like, <laughs> I have to put my hands on my chest to like hold myself down. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> So when you're talking about like panic attacks this morning, I was also having like, I was, it was right there with you. So not trying to add anything to your plate. But anyway, it was more just a compliment. But I had I get to it. do yoga this morning just to get through the panic attack. So yeah. yes, I hear you. I hear, I hear you. Yes. I think we're all here right yes, now. It's I don't a, know a single person who's not. It's true. So it's a we're in particularly it stressful time <laughs> for particularly anxious people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That'll be the chapter title of this phase of my, of I my love life. It. <laughs> awesome. Well, Lauren, thank you so yeah. much. I'm so glad we got to chat. This has been such a joy. I feel like Same. I just dipped into like a really interesting book for, <laughs> you know, a few uh, you know, minutes or whatever. So anyway, thank you, Zibby. enjoy Florida and I hope to thank meet you. in person someday. Good luck with it all your Same. stuff. Same. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 